Good morning again to those in the building. Deja vu, I've just said good morning to you, I'm saying it to you again as our live stream begins. So welcome online, those that are joining us online. Uh, it's good to have you with us as well as to have all of you lovely smiling faces with us as well in the building. We're going to have a time of sung worship this morning with Jez and Emma leading us, or Emma and Jez. Uh, and then we're going to be hearing a message from the Bible uh, that Ollie's going to bring to us, uh, continuing our series in the book of Philippians. Uh, and then we'll go back into another short time of sung worship after that. Looking forward to it this morning. Looking forward to uh, praising God together and hearing more about him. So let's pray. Uh, I'm going to pray for us while we start. Yeah, Father God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the lovely sunshine that we're experiencing here in Sunbury. Thank you for a chance to gather together. Thank you for the freedom to do that. And Lord, we uh, want to praise your name this morning, bring glory to you, and come and know more about you this morning, Lord. Be with us this morning, we pray. Amen. Emma. Good morning. Are we ready to worship our loving Heavenly Father this morning? Feel free to stand, feel free to sit, dance, wave a flag, do whatever, but let's come and bring our worship to God this morning.
Yes, God, how great you are. We worship you this morning, Lord. We bring you praise. Thank you, God. Amen. Uh, if you'd take, take, like to take your seats. Uh, I realized I didn't introduce myself as I came in. I think most people know me. But if you don't, uh, my name is David. I'm part of the leadership team here. Uh, welcome, particularly if you're a first-timer. If you're watching for the first time online, welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, if you are new or if you feel new still, uh, do let us know. And we'd uh, love to get you to know you more. Um, That'd be great. It is my time to do the notices, and I'm quite sad because there aren't that many notices. Um, maybe that's a good thing for some of you. So, uh, notices are this morning that Andy Phillips, our full time elder, is on holiday. Well, is it holiday? It is holiday, isn't it, in the Philippines? Yeah. Uh, he is not holiday in the Philippines? No. No, he's very much working in the Philippines. Both, bit of both. So, um, but the news is that Andy has touched down safely in the Philippines uh, with his soon-to-be daughter-in-law, Yanni. Uh, they've arrived safely and lots of excited faces in pictures on Facebook. That if you have Andy on Facebook, I'm sure you've seen those. Um, so thank you for praying uh, for Andy and do continue to pray for him as he's out there in the Philippines. As we've said, part holiday, part working. So 
Um, he is serving the church out there as he uh, takes that time in the Philippines. So do keep praying for him and keep praying for that church out in the Philippines that we support, um, Pastor Rolando and Co. It's great. Uh, there are small groups meeting this week, as there are most weeks. So if you are part of a small group, do get along uh, this, morning, uh, this week and uh, make the most of that time together in a smaller context rather than big church group. And if you're not part of a small group, uh, feel free to get in touch. We're more, more than happy to put you in touch with a small group leader and you can get along to those. I think we have some meeting in person, some meeting online still. So whichever suits you best, we can, you can, you know, we can put you in touch with that. So uh, yeah, do do that. And then there was one more notice, which I'm going to have to check my list because I can't remember what it was. <laughs> Ah, yes, food bank. Uh, if you're in the room today, food bank collection happening in the back hall, so if you've got anything for that, do make sure it ends up in that basket there. Uh, if you haven't got any stuff, I'm sure you could rush home as we finish today and, and grab stuff and bring it, and we'll still be able to collect that. Uh, if you're at home, you can come and bring it before we leave to, uh, this after, early this afternoon, so uh, it's not, you've not missed your chance of that. So we... Donate once a month to the food bank run by St. Saviour's, uh, Church of England Church down the road. Uh, so that's great for us to be able to serve in that capacity. So do that. And that is me for notices. So without further ado, I'm going to invite the kids to go out um, and the kids workers. So if you'd like to go out to your sessions, kids work out in the back. And I'm just going to pray for our kids and for our kids' workers uh, this morning. Dear God, thank you for the blessing of children. Thank you for the uh, joy that they bring. Thank you for the... Uh, yeah, thank you for the joy. <laughs> and thank you, Father, for the uh, people we have who serve us so well in uh, serving our kids and teaching them about you. So, Lord, we pray you bless them this morning as they go out to their work and that they would all learn more about you this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen. Right, then I'll invite Ollie up to speak. Actually, we've got a short video to introduce our preaching series. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. How's everyone? Is everyone okay? Has, has someone ever got under your skin so much that you're the, your response in your mind is, I am never, ever speaking to that person again? <laughs> well, one thing I know is this. If how that person has made you feel is not resolved, it can potentially cause disunity. We can become divided through disunity for many different reasons. Disagreements, difference of opinions, a discussion that can escalate and it can like, get into such a bad argument. There are many different things that can cause it. But there is no doubt in my mind that God 
would want us to find ways to deal with conflict so that we could be unified. Does that make sense? However, this is easier said than done, isn't it? You know? When you have any type of group or people commu- or a community together, it is likely that they may rub each other up the wrong way, which can lead to conflict and have a potential cause for disunity. This is because we all have things that irritate us. We have triggers that make us feel annoyed or angry. Or sometimes conflict can arise from miscommunication or just a misunderstanding can cause it. But we can see in the Bible that Jesus taught the disciples that he wanted his people to find ways to be united and one and to be one in him. And before the crucifixion, Jesus prayed that his followers would be one so that they might show his love to the world. This means we are called to be united. So finding ways to resolve disunity is vital for us too today. If I'm honest, I'm a work in progress when it comes to finding positive ways to resolve issues. But in my biblical toolbox, I used to have a gas toolbox, but now I've got a biblical toolbox. God has given me some tools to help me respond and deal with conflict and end disunity. At the end, I'd love to share some of those ways that I've learned that. But before we, before we look at my biblical toolbox, what I want us to do is just jump into a verse. Sorry, I usually work off, this would teach me, I usually work off one of these. It's a, an iPad. And what's happened this morning is I went to load it, it won't load. But lucky, I'm quite good, that um, I'm quite prepared, so I actually always have a a copy, but I can't see it as well. So if I, it's a bit like looking down, it's because it, I just can't see it as good. So, yeah. What I want us to do is I want to look at two names. These names are Uodi and Sinkita. I'm going to really struggle to say them. I've had to try to learn lots, okay? Yeah? So what I'd like us to do is consider these names. Right? And Paul's concerned for them. As I feel we can learn from this so that disunity, disunity doesn't divide us. In church, it's not just for churches, but even within our families and with our work colleagues. So it's much wider than just the church here. So let's read the verses together. If you've got a Bible, it's chapter 4, verses 2 to 3. That's all we're reading from. I'll give you a minute. In Philippians, would be helpful. I plead with Yodia and I plead with Sinkita to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Let's pray. Father, even if this this morning just starts a little bit chaotic, Lord, and things going on, Lord, I just pray, Lord, that you'd really settle us down to meet with you now. Lord, I just pray that we would just take a pause. Lord, we've just been worshipping the true king. Lord, and we just want to open your word this morning and just really get to know you in a clear way. Lord, we just pray that you'd speak to us through your word. Lord, convict us and love us, Lord, and we just pray, Lord, to know you more and more. In Jesus' name. Amen. It's obvious that Paul wants these two women to work towards unity. We know this because Paul says, I plead with Uodi and I plead with Sinkita to be the same mind in the Lord. He pleads, he urges these women to find ways to resolve their differences for the sake of unity. The word plead, plead, puts emphasis on how strongly he feels about it and how much he wants them to overcome their differences. This word to plead, to urge or to beg has a sense of real urgency. It reminds me of a word we may use with a loved one. When there's a family feud at a family gathering, there is usually a mother or a father that tries to plead with their children or siblings to try and sort out the issues before everyone disperses and goes their own separate ways. The plead with their loved ones is not to let the argument fester or boil 
away. As we all know what happens when we allow arguments to do that, we get angry inside you, and usually share it with other people and this stokes our inner fire and makes it worse. Paul does not want this to fester or to boil away. So he urges these women, he pleads with them in the letter to deal with the issue. This is a serious matter. Paul wants him to deal with what is going on. Another reason we know this matter was of great importance to Paul is his huge use of the, sorry, his use of the ladies' names. If you consider Paul's letters, he rarely uses names in relation to issues of conflict. We tend to find Paul using names in his greetings and he speaks of those who he is grafted with for the sake of bringing the good news of Jesus to others. But he does not use names when addressing conflict very often. However, Paul is not using these ladies' names here to name and shame them, which would be likely to happen in today's media, wouldn't it? Consider a tabloid paper. They shame someone for doing something wrong. They love to find dirt on someone and shame that person. Paul names Euodi and Sinkita not to single them out. No. It is the absolute opposite. Paul wants them to work through their difficulty. He knows these women well. They have worked alongside Paul. What did it say in verse 3? They have contended at my side for the cause of the gospel. When Paul speaks of the gospel, he means bringing the good news of Jesus to the lost or serving the house churches in Philippi. Naming people by using their names in a letter in the ancient world showed friendship with them. In a critical letter, so something that's more critical, leaving a person unnamed, highlighted, there was an issue. A good example is Paul's letter to the church in Corinth. He didn't name those living in sexual misconduct or who were were not being challenged. All the specific names of those taken other Christians to court, did he? If you read the letter, he doesn't. It is not like that in today's world, though, is it? Think of today. The temptation to use social media or an email to take a quick swipe at someone who has rattled us is so, so tempting. We'd be unlikely to avoid using that person's name or what they have done to offend us on social media. But what does it do if we do that? It makes the situation worse and it divides us even more. And this is not what God wants for us. One thing I've learned from my wife, when someone ruffles my tail feathers, is to sleep on it or give it 24 hours before I respond. Using this simple strategy has allowed me to find time to think, pray, and find a better way to resolve things. Paul is not singling them out to shame them. No. Like I said earlier, It is quite the opposite of why he does it. Paul cares for the two women, and he wants the best for them. So he is pleading with them that they would find a way to be united and overcome their differences. I would suggest that the core issue between these two women is not a personal feud. Like my example of a family, like like I was talking earlier about a family feud, it's not the same as that. It seems to me, from my reading of it, it's more ecclesial. What I mean by this, what I mean by ecclesial is it relates to the church. It's an issue to do with the church. Paul was shown through his letter to the church the importance, so he's shown the importance through the four chapters, yeah? He has shown the importance of corporate unity. And he's shown that by using the word being of one mind. Remember, this is a letter to the people in Philippi. This type of letter would be read out loud in full to them. One of the important emphases within Paul's letter is unity for the local church in Philippi. For Paul to mention this specific situation and use these women's names... 
shows urgency. The issue must be resolved as Paul does not want it to cause disunity in the church. How did Paul ask them to do it though? He told them to have the same mindset as the Lord or as Christ. You read that in verse 3. Paul also spoke about believers having the same mindset in chapter 2. He said in chapter 2, verse 2, this is a different verse to what we, we, we're looking at. So this is chapter 2, verse 2. It says this. Make my joy complete by being like-minded. Write this bit down as well. Having the same love, being one in spirit and one mind. What makes Paul's joy complete? For the people of God to be of one mind. This understanding of being one mind or maturity is a recurring theme in his letter. Paul wants them to think of the people in the community in a certain way. This is not take away this, this is not taking away our ability to think. Paul's not saying to the believers you should be robots and programmed to think in the same way and do the same things. I'm not saying that. He wants them to have a common goal. And the goal is explained in chapter 2, but in verse 3 and 4. So we've had verse 2, and then he moves on to verses 3 and 4 in chapter 2, and he says this. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. Not look into your own interests, but each of you to the interest of others. He says to all believers to put others before themselves. And he is saying this to the women who have fallen out as well. This shared goal of putting others before themselves can only be achieved through what Paul said about finding a mutual love for each other in verse 2. Do you remember when I said in chapter 2, verse 2, it says, make my joy complete. There are four things there that talk about making Paul's joy complete. Being like-minded, the same love, being of one spirit and one mind. What we find is the ingredient that can resolve this unity is love. Because disunity divides, but love unifies. Yeah? Well, what if we try to pray and ask the Holy Spirit to help us think in this way? Well, the truth is, it would be a tall ask, wouldn't it? And we'd find it difficult at times. But if we... Or the people in Philippi need inspiration for putting others before their own interests. Where can they look? Well, they find the inspiration in Jesus. Remember what Paul said to them about having the same mindset as Christ. And what we read in chapter 2, verses 5 to 8. Let me read these to you. So this is, again, we're in chapter 2, so we've moved backwards, but we're now looking at Verse 5 to 8. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature, God, did not consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in the appearance of a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Jesus, who is fully God, and fully human, did not use his equality with God to his own advantage. But what does he do? He takes the lowest position as a servant and dies for the sake of others. So there is the inspiration for the church in Philippi and for us. Our inspiration as to how to handle and resolve disunity with someone else within the church is be to consider Jesus. Remember what we spoke about a few months ago. About God being one and also three distinct persons, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. And how Jesus was incarnated and took on flesh. 
God took the lowest position rather than the highest for the sake of others. This will be our inspiration as we consider how to show love within the church and as we find ways to forgive someone who has offended us. To look towards Jesus first and foremost and look towards the cross. Maybe this morning you are listening and you've been really hurt by someone in a way which cuts you up inside. Maybe you need to find a way to forgive someone and you are struggling with it. I would suggest looking towards Jesus, the Son of God, who gave up everything for others. This is the only, this is the only place to start. He will meet you in your heart if you ask him. He will woo you and love you until you are restored enough to let what happened go. If you walk in that relationship, if you don't know him, and if you do know him, this is all about Jesus. He is our inspiration. He is our king. He is the one who saves his people. And he is our God. Therefore, the starting point for anyone, believers or non-believers, is a place of confession that Jesus is the Son of God. Confessing who King Jesus is, is not just the right starting place, it is the only place to start. We need to put our faith in the King. The humility of King Jesus is extraordinary. It should blow our minds. If you don't know Jesus this morning, he is the king and he loves you and wants you to know him. He wants you to get to know him as your king and don't miss out on that. Please. The almighty creator of the universe humbled himself for others. Taking the position of a slave and led the way. What an extraordinary story. This should utterly blow our minds. It should blow you, you O.D. and Sinkity's minds. And we should follow Jesus' example in putting others before ourselves for the sake of Jesus' bride, the church. But what is the church? The church is the believers that gather. What Paul wants for the women, he mentions in the text, is for them to let go of self and find love for the person who has offended them. They are believers, and so they are to have the same mindset as Christ. And only from that starting point can the women do that. So these women, in the power of the Holy Spirit, are to show humility and value each other above themselves. Unity can only be achieved through the spirit-empowered transformation in believers as they reflect Christ in their lives. The common mind of the church, including these two women, is to share a mutual love and reconciliation which sets the unity of the church above personal interests. This is something God wants his people to do. He wants us to strive together as one body. Think what he said to the church in Corinth. We are the body of Christ and every single member is important. All of you. Everyone in this room, everyone online is important. Jesus loves you. We love each other. We work for a common goal. Yeah? And we are called to be united in Christ. Amen? The truth is, just unity divides, but love provides us with a Christ-centered outlook on conflict. And this is good news. This text speaks predominantly to believers, but we can find conflict wherever people gather, like in families, the workplace, any type of community setting where people gather. Even in church, there's been lots of divisions over the years in churches, isn't there? So this teaching 
to strive for unity by, be, by resolving differences important for everyone. I'm in no sense saying you should let people walk all over you. So it's important to use godly wisdom as we all discern how to respond to specific issues that have caused upset, friction or disunity. Sometimes we can feel so hurt by a comment someone else makes that we might want to ask someone to support us by talking and praying it through with them, with someone else. Paul spoke about that in verse 3. He said, I ask you, my true companion, help these women since they have contended at my side. In the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. This shows us that Christians should help each other to find ways to diffuse issues, to find love for others, and to reconcile. Paul was asking Clement to help the women in this so the church can be unified. So it's a corporate thing, it's doing it together, yeah? If you're thinking, well, what in church could cause disunity? There are lots of things. We can disagree over interpretation of a Bible passage. It's caused lots of stuff over the years. When, when change happens, I think now at the moment as we go through transition, you know, we can feel hurt, we can feel worried. It's okay to feel those things. There's nothing wrong with that, that's okay. But if we hear something in a certain way, and we take it, or we take something the wrong way, or someone says something in the wrong way, that can cause friction. And that can cause disunity, and we don't, that's not what God would want for any of us, is it? Not in our families, not in the church, you know, not in a work, with work colleagues, yeah? As I said earlier, I'm definitely a work in progress when it comes to laying my feelings down and thinking of others for the sake of unity, seriously, you know? I'm not standing here saying I've got this all licked and I know what I'm doing. I don't. I, I've, God's given me some tools. And there are certain tools that I thought, I was praying and I was thinking, well, what are some of the things that I found helpful when it comes to things getting under my skin or feeling that kind of divide or someone's upset me to the point I don't really want to talk to them. You know, what, what are some of the things in my toolbox that God has shown me? And I don't want to give loads because I thought that would be unhelpful. So I just thought I'd give, I've got free. So if you're happy, I thought we'd look in my biblical toolbox. And I love that word, sorry. I'm going to keep saying it. I, that's my last time to say it. So, um, so let's look at these three. Let me see if I can get this up, prop, do this properly. One more. Okay. I was, does anyone know about PowerPoints? When you press it and then it gives you one, the second and the third. I was supposed to do that and I've not done it properly. So you see them all in one go. That's not the idea. It's supposed to be like, like, bing. Right, let's move forward. If I get into conflict, my initial reaction can be to irritate, to be irritated and annoyed with, other, with the other person and think... It is their fault. Just, you know? But what I've learned over the years is the importance of reflecting with God on my part in it and not theirs. Incredibly helpful. Seriously. The truth is most conflict issues between people, like a disagreement or an argument, it doesn't tend to be 100% one person's fault. When my son argues with someone, and it does happen every once in a while, I say to him, it takes two to tango. It does. Of course, there are sometimes incidents when someone is victimised or bullied. And this is not the same as what I'm talking about here. But conflict causes disunity, and we usually find we may have a part to play in it. That's all I'm saying, yeah? But what I do is I pray and I journal about my part in the conflict, not the other person's. And I ask God to show me what I can do to deal with my behaviour. Painful. Yeah? Surprisingly enough, what usually happens is I find things in my character which I need to work on, and I ask God to help me with it. 
And then I find ways to deal with the issue with the other person. I'm laughing because it's quite a painful journey. If anyone's done it, if you look at yourself and not everyone else, you start to find your own character flaws. And the truth, the truth is I can't, deal, I, can, I can't deal with other people. God can. But I can pray and ask God to deal with the stuff that's wrong in me and how I can respond to things better. Does that make sense? Yeah? So that's all I'm saying. So that is one. And the second one is this. Another thing that God has shown me that can help is this. When someone gets under your skin, stop talking about the person and talk to them. Yeah? Talking in an unhealthy way to others or using social media to take a swipe at someone who has upset you will not help. Remember what I said about Ellie and what she said to me. Ollie, why don't you try and give it 24 hours, pray about it and sleep on it before sending a message to them? Yeah? I'm laughing because I've actually done it. So, and she has said it. Ellie and I will pick each other up as well if we feel a conversation about someone or something we are upset about starts to become unhealthy. Yeah? Does that make sense? So if you're at home and you're talking about stuff and it feels like it's going in an unhealthy way, that you're not talking about it, how it can build something up or resolve something, but it's more taking a swipe, maybe you need to take a step back. The Bible teaches us, doesn't it? If your brother or sister sins against you, go and tell them him or her's fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother or the sister. This would be the same if we want to resolve a disagreement. We should go to someone in love and talk through the issue. Maybe we could talk to someone we trust who could pray and help us before we go and speak to the other person. But we need to work towards a goal that helps us bring disunity and upset to an end. Remember what I've been saying, disunity divides. But what does love do? Unifies. Yeah? If you take this approach, be specific about the issue and talk in a way that does not blame the other person. And own your own part, as this will only help you. And only go when God has brought you into a loving place for that person. This will stop sending things and doing things that are unhelpful and unloving. We don't want to do that, do we? We don't want to do that. Worse, you don't want to do it at work. You don't want to do it with family members. You know, the... Say something in a quick text, cha-ching, goes off, doesn't it? You know? It reminds me a little bit of um, a boxer. Like, and sometimes you'll see in a boxing match, more in amateur boxing, one boxer will be really frustrated because they, they, can't, they can't get any punches off. And as, the, as they ring the bell and it just comes to a stop, they quickly throw a punch in the, other, in the person's face. And it's because they're so irritated and they take a quick swipe. And that reminds me of like when we fire off emails or we fire off at people. Does that make sense? Like, you know, it's not what God wants for us. Yeah? My last one, and this is the most important, prayer. Prayer is our most powerful tool to diffuse conflict and get our hearts in the right place with another person and God. Yeah? Spending time praying and seeking God to help you resolve the issue and and bring unity is just so important. We need to be spending time in prayer and asking God to speak into it. Praying for the person who has upset you and for the families and for their family to be impacted and to to find spiritual growth in that time. Do you see what I'm doing? I'm trying to reverse that. Instead of praying, if you pray through an, an angry feeling... Then get to a place where you can pray for that person in a good way. Pray for them. Pray for their families. Pray for God to break into their lives. Does that make sense? You know? I'm not taking away that it's hard to pray for people. And it's so hard if someone's upset you. So don't hear that in the right way. I know it's hard. But it's a journey. You do it with your Father God who loves you. You know, it's time spent with him in a wonderful relationship. Like I said before, owning your own part and learning to talk to someone rather than talking about them 
are incredibly helpful. And making sure we pray is so vital. We can use these strategies in any context, with family, social context, or wherever it's needed. But remember to open the Bible and look and pray about Philippians, especially the verses, chapter 2, verses 1 to 8. And ask God to give you a heart that puts others before yourselves. That is hard, especially in that situation. Within the church, we really need to do this, as putting others before our needs stands out in the world and shows that we are salt and light. The truth is, we are the church, and the church is a signpost pointing to King Jesus. For us as a church family, going through a leadership transition and a time of change, we may feel worried or upset about different things at different times. But we must work hard as a loving family to work towards unity within church, even if we find those changes hard. Putting some of the practical things that I've spoken about today into practice could help with this. Walking in unity together is so important. It is how we show Christ's love to the world, guys. So if you struggle, chat with me or with someone on the senior leadership team. Because we'd love to talk to you about any of those issues that you struggle with around transition and change. If we look towards Jesus and we look towards his ways, we can find ways to use love to resolve issues that God would want us to. Disunity divides, but love unifies. Let me pray, and I'll ask Dave and the worship band to come back up. Father, we do thank you, Lord, that you are such a loving and wonderful Father. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you are the one that challenges our hearts, Lord, and directs us and allows us to grow in you. Lord, if there is any hurt or pain, Lord, where people have been hurt today, Lord, and there's things that need to resolve, Lord, I pray that you'd meet with them as a wonderful father. Lord, and if there's areas that just need to be worked out, Lord, we just pray, Lord, that you'd have your way. You are so awesome, Jesus. And we love you so much, and we just pray for your love to be poured out. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Ollie. Right, so we're going to come back into a time of sung worship now. Uh, as we finish, as we go through one more song, as we finish that song, we're going to end the live stream there. So those of you joining online, thank you for being with us. And we're glad to have been able to serve you, and we pray you have a really good week. If you want to get in touch with anything you've, in response to anything you've heard today, do send us an email or put a comment on the Facebook feed, and we'll get in touch. Let's worship. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Ollie, for that word. We're going to sing Water You Turned Into Wine. It talks about how great our God is, how strong he is, and how he's that much higher than anything we're facing, anything we're dealing with. Um, so if anything that um, Ollie's brought this morning really speaks to you, maybe take some time this morning and just reflect on how amazing God is and how he can help you deal with any situations and circumstances that you've got going on. Let's sing together. Water you turn. 